Well, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about um, one of the worst genocides of the 20th century, uh, the killing fields of Cambodia. Before I do that, let me get into uh, what happened before the killing fields took place in Cambodia and describe to you the, uh, the situation in Cambodia in the 1960s. Cambodia was a pretty much uh, developing, typical developing Asian country. It exported more rice than it imported. It was uh, such an example of development that Lee Kuan Yew came to Cambodia when Singapore became independent to learn more about nation building. Uh, Cambodia was at the time really an island of peace while the war raged on in Vietnam. To make it a little more personal, let me introduce you to my late mother, who passed away in October of last year. Uh, she was born in 1936 and had a pretty typical uh, childhood. She enjoyed the beach. She learned languages, uh, one of which was Vietnamese, which would come in handy later on in her life and in mine. Here she is with my father in uh, 1969, the last year before the uh, uh, Vietnam War spilled into Cambodia. And uh, descended uh, the country into chaos. They were probably taking a uh, vacation in the country at the time. So six years later, the Khmer Rouge come to power in Cambodia. They essentially reorder society completely. Uh, my parents lived in Phnom Penh, where more than a million people had amassed, and they were moved to the countryside. Uh, they were made to work in the fields. Uh, one of the consequences when you have people who aren't used to living in the, in the countryside and they're made to work in the field is they die. So one out of uh, four Cambodians ends up dead, including my father of malnutrition and dysentery. Uh, he died in a Khmer Rouge rat-infested hospital, if you can even call it that. Um, and the only reason why I'm here today and why my four siblings are still alive is because my mother spoke Vietnamese and used Vietnamese as a passport to freedom. Uh, she was given the opportunity to uh, leave Cambodia if she could prove she was Vietnamese by speaking the language. And uh, her Vietnamese was in fact so bad that she gave all the boys girls' names and all the girls' boys' names. And it wasn't until a lady told her, you know, you've made this mistake and tutored her for three days that she became aware and was able to pass two exams, one by the Khmer Rouge and one by the Vietnamese cadres, uh, as to her ability to prove herself as Vietnamese. She bundled us up in, uh, in blankets to make it look like we were sick and couldn't speak at that moment, so that's how we made it out. What did uh, the Khmer Rouge promise the Cambodian people? Well, they promised them a kind of utopia, agrarian utopia, where, uh, if you remember John Lennon's song, Imagine, uh, no possessions, uh, no religion. In fact, the only thing that people had was, was a spoon, which they could use to eat uh, the daily porridge that was given to them, porridge that was far insufficient for the work that they had to do in, uh, in the fields, uh, this manual labor. What the Khmer Rouge achieved, essentially, what they got was 1.7 million dead as a result. And the leader, whom I'm sure you're very familiar with, is uh, Pol Pot. He was a man who could smile at you and order your execution the same, uh, the same night. And in fact, he himself dies in 1998 without so much as a trial uh, in his sleep and is burned on a pile of tires afterwards. Now let me take it to a point where you might, you know, 1.7 million people, a million here, a million there, it doesn't make any sense. So let's take a visit to a place called Tool Slang, a, a school that was turned into a torture center. Uh, 16,000 people there died. Uh, about 12 are known to have survived. This place, these classrooms were turned into torture chambers, uh, beds that became medieval torture devices, chains extracting confessions from people. Uh, this is a scene from uh, 1979 when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and discovered tool slang, and they wanted to document the scene. Of course, the bodies are, uh, of the 16,000 were buried in killing fields, but this is what happened to them before they were buried. The rules at Tool Slang were insane. You couldn't cry if you were being electrocuted because you weren't allowed to. You'd be electrocuted some more. You could be accused of being both KGB and CIA agents at the same time. It was impossible to defeat this Kafkaesque uh, uh, system of regulations. 
some of the devices used to torture people. I'm going to go through a series of pictures now of, of the faces of people who were deemed to be enemies of the revolution, enemies of the organization, and who were subsequently killed at Tool Slang. This young man here wears the number 17. If you can see, he's, uh, it's not very clear here, but his number is actually pinned to his skin. He's not, of course, complaining about that. I think he knows what's going to happen next. The faces of, of, the, of the men and, and women, the boys grabbed to the arm there, who were killed at Tool Slang, what did they do? Girls, a mother with her infant, all executed, tortured before their death. And they didn't discriminate between genders. They didn't discriminate for age. What happened was bludgeonings. What happened was death. And yet, if you'll believe me, there were people in the West who actually supported the revolution who believed that what was happening in Cambodia was actually good. These people were individuals, individuals like Malcolm Caldwell, a professor at the School of Oriental and African Studies, who happens to have interviewed Pol Pot on Christmas 1978, and the same night after the interview is himself murdered. 528 kilometers from here, a conference took place in Stockholm in which People met on 17, 18 November 1979, after the invasion of Cambodia by Vietnam, to talk about how to reinstall the Khmer Rouge into power. It was a conference not unlike ours today, pretty much a, a serious conference of individuals talking about serious issues, pressing human rights abuses. Jan Myrdal, for example, was a keynote address. He's a uh, famous Swedish uh, journalist. Uh, Professor Sam Newmoff of McGill University talked about the role of the Soviet Union in the present Kampuchean crisis. I'm sure he was blaming the Soviet Union for causing this imbalance of power. He's actually, uh, he actually spent 40 years on the faculty at McGill University before retiring in 2006, fully tenured, a full professor. He last wrote about recently on Vietnam and Iraq. Is there a difference? Perhaps he should have written about Cambodia and Iraq, will there be a difference? There was a man by the name of George Hildebrand, who with Gareth Porter wrote one of the first books on the Khmer Revolution. In 1976, this book came out, and it talked about essentially what a wonderful revolution took place in Cambodia. It had propaganda pictures, a picture of an operating room in a hospital run by the Khmer Rouge, to show just how advanced they were. Well. One of the people who didn't go to this conference was Noam Chomsky, but he did have the following to say about the book by Hildebrand and Porter, namely that it presents a carefully documented study of the destructive American impact on Cambodia and the success of the Cambodian revolutionaries in overcoming it, giving a very favorable picture of their program and policies based on a wide range of sources. This is written in 1977 and repeated more or less in 1979 in a book that he publishes with uh, Edward Herman. But the star of the conference was a woman by the name of Ieng Tiret. She was the uh, Minister of Social Affairs for Democratic Kampuchea, what the Khmer Rouge re renamed Cambodia, and she was the head of delegation that came to Stockholm. There she is, feted by other participants in glasses, uh, taking a uh, standing ovation, I'm sure. Well, Justice uh, will catch up with her, but not before she has freedom for the next 30 years. Here she is with her husband, Ying Sari, who is, was the foreign minister for Democratic Kampuchea. Um, he, of course, ends up a very well-to-do man after the revolution. In uh, a couple of years ago, Ying Tiret ends up at the docket at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, finally facing some measure of justice, as does her husband. And here, uh, the head of the uh, prison torture center at Tul Slang. He's also on the docket. His case is the first one to go before trial, and after four years and over $100 million, there hasn't been a verdict yet, though we might yet get one soon. So, what is the importance of having an accurate historical record? I mean, I'm a professor. 
I want the truth, but of course, if we follow George Santayana's plea about those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, perhaps we can be more amused by the following, namely that mistakes maybe could be that the purpose of your life, our lives as victims of genocide is that we serve as a warning to others. But if not, then at least that genocide should have no statute of limitations and that we should never forget and that we should remember everything that happens. Thank you. Thank you.